This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. Okay, uh, now, in this lecture, I'm going to explain what we mean by this lock-in rate that you might see mentioned in the context of uh, foreign exchange currency futures, uh, what it means and the relevance, how we calculate. Uh, and I will ultimately just give you a rule but as always, you can't simply learn a rule at P4. You, you must understand what's happening. Um, now, it is vital before um, watching this that you have been through the previous lecture on futures, where I explained what futures are and I explained how they work. Uh, you must have been through that first because uh, I am not going to repeat in great detail all the logic behind how futures work here. If you haven't been through the earlier lecture, then stop this and go through it. If you have been through it, then, well, you should have no problem. Now, to explain what it is we're talking about and the relevance and everything, uh, I'm going to make up a very, very simple example. Uh, it's not in the notes, so you might need to write this down, but it's very short. Suppose I tell you that today is the 1st of April. Uh, we're in the UK, I'm not going to bother writing that down, but we're in the UK, so we work in pounds, but we're going to receive $1 million on the 1st of August. Now, I said I'm not going to repeat the whole um, chapter that was in the earlier lectures, uh, but of course, the problem is that by 1st of uh, August, exchange rates may have changed. The spot rate on the 1st of April is 1.50 dollars to the pound. And we're going to use futures uh, to hedge against the risk. Um, suppose I tell you the September futures price on the 1st of April is, <coughs> excuse me, dollar pound, 1.47. <coughs> so there we are. Nice, simple example. Have I got everything there? Yes, I have. It's September futures. Remember in the exam, you'll um, probably have a selection of futures but you need the first future, or the future that ends first after the date of the transaction. The transaction is the 1st of August. Uh, and so, given the, the futures are March, June, September, December, the first date after the 1st of August is September, so you'll be going for September futures. All right, now, I said, I, I do need to explain the logic before I just give you a rule about locking rate. So first of all, forget anything to do with locking rate. Let's do it the way we did before in the previous lecture and the way that still can be asked in the exam. Uh, what happens? What happens today is we leave the transaction at risk. And so transaction sells a million, we'll convert at whatever the spot ends up being on the 1st of August. But we'll start a futures deal. And what will we do? We're we going to receive dollars. And so uh, we'll, these will be pound futures. I haven't given you a contract size, but we'll buy futures. September futures at what's the current price? A uh, dollar, a uh, dollar forty-seven. And if you remember, we sit and wait till the date of the transaction. On the date of the transaction, we'll convert the million dollars at whatever spot happens to be, and we'll work out our profit or loss on futures. 
uh, which will cancel out the gain or loss on the um, transaction itself. Now, the way we did it to illustrate We needed to know what the spot rate was on the date of the transaction. So I'll do it that way first and I can uh, sort of prove everything to you. Suppose I tell you spot on the 1st of August, it could obviously be anything, but suppose it's changed to 1.52. I said earlier, if you're given a figure, obviously you'll use the figure you're given. If you're not given a figure, you can make up any figure to, to prove you know how it works. To be able to illustrate, we need to know what the futures price is. And so, again, I did say it's vital you've been through the earlier lecture, but you'll know that to get the futures price, the basis, we assume, falls linearly over the life of the future. So I'll do it the way I, I, I set it up before. As of today, the 1st of April, uh, the spot is what? Uh, 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 1.50. The futures price as of today is 1.47. So the difference, the basis, is 0 0.03. We need to know the position on... Uh, the date of the transaction, the 1st of August. We're assuming um, a spot rate of 1.52. To get the futures price, we assume the basis, the difference between them, falls linearly by the end of the future. Well, the future ends on the last day of September. There are 30 days in September. The difference, whatever they were on that date, would be zero. And so we apportion. So between April and September is how many months? April, May, June, July, August, September is six months. Uh, as of the uh, 1st of August, how many months are remaining? The whole of August and September, two months. And so the basis is falling by one sixth a month. It'll have fallen by four sixths, or there'll be two sixths left. Point zero 0.01. And on that assumption, because remember in real life there's no reason it should fall linearly, but on that assumption we would estimate a futures price to be, it was three below, to be one below, 1.51. Well, now let's illustrate, and nothing new, you know, this is exactly uh, how I was doing it in the earlier chapter. Uh, just one thing for a deliberate reason, which I'll explain afterwards, it doesn't destroy anything. Um, when we're buying the futures, remember, um, there are fixed size contracts. So if the contract size was £100,000, we'd have to do this converting and get it in numbers of contracts. Just for this, because I want to prove something to you, uh, we're going to assume that we're not limited by contract size. And so the futures we're dealing in, it was one million dollars were at risk. Remember, we started the deal, we buy futures on, what was it, 1st of April. On 1st of April, the spot rate was 1.50 and so we'd be gambling on I think six 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 ooh, seven futures. Now I know I just said it but in real life you couldn't gamble on precisely that amount You'd have to divide by uh, the contract size in fixed size contracts. But I'll come back to the relevance of that after. Let's assume that we could buy 666667 uh, futures exactly. 
All right, let's see what happens on the date of the transaction. Uh, remember two things. Sorry, this is the 1st of August. Remember two things happen. Uh, first of all, we convert the transaction at spot. Oh dear, I can't spell. Convert. What was it? It was a million dollars. Uh, we've been assuming a spot rate on the 1st of August of 1.52. So that converts to 657895. And I'm not really interested, but spot has moved against us. And so it's less than we would have received, you know, had we been converting at the start of all this. But secondly, we've got our profit or loss on futures. The amount we were gambling was how much? 666667 pounds. The profit or loss is the difference between the buy price and the sell price. Well, we bought futures on the 1st of April at 1.47. We sell them on the 1st of August at 1.51. And so here we're making a profit on the futures of 4 cents per pound. 666667 times 4. The profit is 26667. There's tiny bits of rounding here, appreciate. But the profit, remember, is in dollars. We make a profit of four cents on every pound. And so we need to convert that into pounds. Uh, this happens, remember, on 1st of August. On 1st of August, the spot is 1.52. And so a profit of One seven five four four. They both receipts. Remember, we're receiving the dollars, so um, that's the pound receipt when we convert. It was a profit on the futures, and so the total receipt six five seven eight nine five plus seventeen five four four is six seven five four three nine. Now I said I don't want to talk on and on here because. So far, apart from, yet again, ignoring the contract size, so far it's exactly what we were doing in that earlier lecture. And you know the score, that here, because the exchange rate moved against us, we received, we lost, in a sense, uh, on the transaction. But to compensate, we gained on the futures. Uh, it's not a perfect hedge. I went through that before as well. If it was a perfect hedge, we'd end up with exactly the same as if we'd converted it to day spot. Here, in fact, we've gained a bit, we may end up losing a bit. But why isn't it a perfect hedge? The reason is, if you remember, that the change in the spot rate is different than the change in the futures price. That's what causes the problem. If spot and futures, if they'd both moved by the same amount, you know, the spot moved by 0 0.02, if the futures had moved by 0 0.02, then the hedge would have been perfect. We'd have ended up uh, losing on the transaction and making an identical gain on the futures. But we don't get perfect hedges because spot and futures move at different rates. Again, spots move by 0 0.02, futures has moved by 0 0.04. Um, it's because the basis has changed. It's gone from 0 0.03 to 0 0.01. If the difference between them changes, clearly, they're not moving by the same amount. You won't end up with a perfect hedge. 
However, the problem, of course, we've illustrated quite happily. But of course, when you start the, um, the futures deal, you'll know you won't end up with a perfect hedge, fine. But you've no idea what spot rate's going to be on the 1st of August. No idea at all. Here, either the question told us to assume the spot was 1.52, or we just guessed a figure to be able to illustrate. But clearly, we've absolutely no idea what spot's going to be, and therefore we've no idea what future's going to be. However, right from day one, we can, in fact, predict the final outcome. And you see, the reason we can predict it is what I said a minute ago. If spot and futures had moved by the same amount, if the basis had stayed constant at 0 0.03, we'd have had a perfect hedge. It would have been equivalent to have converted at today's spot. We know it's not a perfect hedge, but we know exactly why. We can measure exactly why. Because even if we don't know what the spot is on 1st of August, we can still estimate what will happen to the basis. We know today the difference is 0 0.03. We know that by the 1st of August, whatever spot and futures happen to be, we know the basis will be two sixths of it, it'll be 0 0.01. And so we can predict on the 1st of April what the net effect's going to be. And it's the lock in rate. On 1st of April, we can predict uh, the overall effect, whatever the spot ends up being, uh, by calculating what we call a lock-in rate. And the two ways you can get the same figure, it's the same logic and it doesn't matter, but remember, we know what the, the current spot is. The current spot on the 1st of April was, I hope I'm right here, uh, dollar pound is certainly, 1.50. If it wasn't for this problem with the basis, then uh, the end result would be a perfect hedge. We effectively convert to 1.50. However, there is the problem of the basis, and we know we were able, as I said a minute ago, even without knowing what the rate's going to be on 1st of August, we know what happened to the basis. It's currently 0 0.03. Counting in months of portioning, it'll change to 0 0.01. So the change in the basis... is 0 0.02 and that's what's stopping it being a perfect hedge and we put the two together uh, now it could be plus or minus uh, what you do is this the two effectively must get closer together so the moment the spot is higher than the futures price this lock-in rate because the futures price is lower than the uh, spot, the lock-in rate is lower than the spot. It's 1.48. And what I mean by the lock-in rate is that the end result of what happens on 1st of August, converting at spot on 1st of August and getting a profit and loss on futures, the end result, the overall result, on 1st of August. Let's apply the lock-in rate. It's a million dollars we're receiving. Uh, divide by the lock-in rate of 1.48. And the overall result, 1,000,000. 000. 
divided by 1.48 is 675676, which I don't think is exactly what we had earlier, 675439. But you're going to have to trust me, the difference there is simply rounding and irrelevant. You know, who cares about a few hundred when we're talking about six or seven hundred thousand? But <clears throat> we can predict from the very beginning uh, what the net effect's going to be. And you see, it doesn't matter what spot is. You know, uh, you could repeat, we did earlier, I, I've said this in the previous lecture again. But you see, um, <clears throat> you could do all that, everything we did there again, uh, assuming the spot on 1st of August was 1.58. The futures price would be something else, you'd come to the same net result, give or take a bit of rounding. It doesn't matter what happens to the spot rate, the net effect of using futures will be as though we were converting at 1.48. I said you can get it two ways. You either take the current spot and adjust by the change in the basis, or if you prefer, you take the current futures price uh, on the 1st of April. This is when it all starts, remember. But on the 1st of April, we had a futures price of 1.47. And you adjust that by the estimate of the basis on the date of the transaction. I know I keep repeating myself, but of course, when it comes to the 1st of September, whatever future spot happened to be is no longer relevant. <clears throat> uh, we know the basis will have fallen to two sixths of what it currently is, which is 0 0.01. And again, as to whether you add or subtract, the way to remember is the two are, uh, will sort of converge. Uh, at the moment, spot 1.5, futures 1.47. The locking will be between, between the two. So because spot is higher, we will add. And again, it's 1.48. Um, and either way, we'll always give the same, it doesn't matter. I personally prefer the first. I just think it's easy for me to remember the logic as to why. Why isn't it current spot? Because of the change in the basis. I find that easier. It doesn't matter. Some answers, whether you use logging rate, they may have done it that way, but it doesn't make any difference. It's, it's the same final figure. Just one last thing to, to mention. I said at the very beginning that I've kept this very, I was going to say very brief, in fact it's taken me ages, but I tried to keep the example very short and I ignored, uh, oh, I won't keep winding back, I'll be winding back forever. Oh no, we'll be there. I ignored the fact, uh, the thing about contract sizes, um, that we want to, um, where were we? We wanted to gamble 666667 on futures, and in this example we did. Uh, but in the exam and in real life, if I were to tell you the futures, there's a contract size of hundred thousand pounds. It would have been to the nearest contract. It would have been seven contracts, and it wouldn't balance exactly. Uh, well, it, without me doing more examples, what I'm about to say should really make sense. The lock-in rate of in this one, uh, one point four eight. It's an effective fixed exchange rate on the date of the transaction. I'm just repeating what I hope you've already understood me to say. It's the effective net result, the net of converting that spot together with your profit or loss on futures. That's what the locking rate is, effectively a fixed rate, but it only applies to the contract amount. So 
So you know, in this case, if we if we had have had contracts of hundred thousand, and therefore you'd gone for seven contracts. Well, on seven contracts of hundred thousand, you would have fixed a rate at one point four eight. This is a fixed rate on the total amount you've gambled. Um, any remaining amount is left at risk. So the difference between the actual amount and the amount, the contract amount of your futures would be left at risk. Uh, but of course, you could consider using the forward rate on this amount. Because again, you know from the very beginning uh, how much you can gamble uh, a deal in futures on. You know from the very beginning how much is left at risk. And so if there are futures rates in, uh, available, and if you wanted to eliminate risk completely, well, the futures will fix it, in this case, at 1.48. Um, to remove the risk on the remainder, um, use forward rates in the normal way.